If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. While you're finding your way there, let me give you a little summary or uh, overview of from whence we have come in our, our couple of weeks of study in Mark's Gospel. We are looking at chapters 8 through 10, essentially, beginning in chapter 8, verse 27 through chapter 10, at what is the heart of the Gospel of Mark. And we're, we're looking, in sort of an, from an overview type of perspective here, capturing uh, the big picture message of, of Mark's Gospel. We talked last week about the theological message of Mark's Gospel, that Jesus is the Christ, that confession is stated a couple of times in the Gospel of Mark. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Mark 16, the Roman centurion standing next to the crucified Savior says, truly, this man is the Son of God. That is the theological message of Mark's Gospel. But practically speaking, there is a message here on discipleship and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus that is pressed, that is emphasized here in chapters 8 through 10. Now there's another layer to that idea. The reason I think that that is so emphasized here in these chapters is that these chapters land just prior to the Passion Week. When Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem to the praise of the people, but within days is crucified, not for crimes that he had done, but for my sin and for yours. Jesus seems to be preparing the disciples here for what life after his immediate physical presence will look like. In other words, until this point, the disciples have been walking by sight. But chapters 8 through 10 is about Jesus getting them ready to walk by faith. About what it's going to look like when we don't have the physical presence of Jesus standing at our side. For the disciples, when their journey with Jesus begins to look a lot more like our journey with Jesus than what they had enjoyed until that time. Now in chapter 9, or chapter 8 rather, as we talked about Peter's confession last week, we talked about the fact that discipleship, that true discipleship, begins with the confession of Jesus as Lord. And we observe that in Peter's own experience. Beyond that, we talked about the fact that a confession of Jesus as, Jesus as Lord has to be biblically informed. Peter didn't seem to understand what he had confessed. God had revealed this truth to him, but he spends the rest of his life fleshing out for himself what it means to say that Christ is Lord over our life. The basic message, that practical message that we mentioned moments ago, is outlined for us in chapter 8, verses 34 and following, where Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Now, we have heard that so many times within Christianity that, that's been talked about. We've batted that around so much that the shock value of that statement has been lost on many of us. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is an audacious statement. Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, take up the emblem of death, take up the cross, and follow after me. March as you declare your confession that Jesus is Lord headlong into persecution and adversity. Embrace the hardships and the challenges of life in the here and now as a follower of Christ. If you genuinely want to be a disciple of Christ, brothers and sisters, you must take up your cross. Now, you may have noticed if you've skipped forward to our reading for this morning, beginning in verse 14, that we have leapt over the Mount of Transfiguration of, uh, the Transfiguration of Jesus, that Mount of Transfiguration uh, text. Let me show you how that works. Our goal here is an overview of these chapters and in some ways an overview of Mark's gospel. But that text in Mark's gospel has a very specific function. There Jesus goes with Peter, James, and John in tow up the mountain, and Elijah and Moses descend, and they're conversing there. 
Luke tells us that they're sharing in conversation about the departure of Jesus, about the exodus of Jesus. In other words, they're talking about how Jesus will do for us in his death, burial, and resurrection what is superior to a perfection of the exodus of Israel and their experience recorded in the book of Exodus. And then God booms forth in this powerful voice, and here's what he says. This is my beloved son, listen to him. Now, if you've lost the sting of take up the cross and follow me, this is here in order to help us to understand that Jesus has not momentarily lost his mind in demanding so much of us. That this audacious statement, take up the cross and follow me, is right God verifies from heaven that this is what discipleship looks like. And so Mark continues, beginning in our text this morning, defining the terms of true discipleship for us, what it looks like on an everyday basis to take up the cross and to follow after Jesus, emphasizing in the present passage the incredible role that prayer plays in the process of discipleship for us. Y'all tracking with me this morning? Are you ready? ready? Let's look at Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. Would you stand with me out of respect and honor for the reading of God's word? The Bible says, When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. All of a sudden, when the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. Then he asked them, What are you arguing with them about? And out of the crowd, one man answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, grinding his teeth and becoming rigid. So I ask your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. And he replied to them, You unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought him to him, and when the spirit saw him, it immediately convulsed the boy. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? From childhood, he said, and many times it's thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible to the one who believes. Immediately the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly coming together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out, shrieking and convulsing him violently. The boy became like a corpse so that many said he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. After he went into a house, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus told them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I don't think that you can overstate the importance of prayer in the life of the believer. There's a certain amount of spiritual warfare that the preacher engages in in the build-up to every sermon preached. If you've ever been assigned with the Sunday school teaching responsibility or to teach in any gospel capacity, you have experienced this yourself. The tension and the frustration and and really the, the opportunity that God often provides at living out the principles of your passage in the days leading up to your teaching or preaching event. But in my experience, there are two topics that when addressed, I find myself engaged with more intense spiritual warfare than at any other time in my ministry. Anytime I preach on family issues, marriage and family issues, there is a ratcheting up of the intensity of spiritual warfare in the days and sometimes even in the weeks leading up to the preaching event. The second is prayer. I, I'm convinced that the devil shudders at the idea of a church deeply committed to prayer. Amen. 
Here, here Jesus is helping the disciples to understand the critical role that prayer, and I would add fasting, plays in our existence as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really an interesting scenario. Go back to verse 14. The Bible says, when they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the scribes disputing with them. So here's the scene. Jesus, Peter, James, and John are on the Mount of Transfiguration. They come back down and they find the rest of the disciples and they're engaged in a debate. I think the setting here is often overlooked. It's somewhat veiled in our passage. They're disputing with those around them. There are scribes who've come to examine the ministry of the disciples. This is the same old hypercritical examination of Jesus' ministry you find in countless other passages in the Gospels. They are there to inspect Jesus and his disciples. Jesus, Peter, James, and John coming off the Mount of Transfiguration it, it come into this situation, and they're the rest of the disciples, and they're engaged in a dispute. Verse 15 says, All of a sudden, when the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. And he asked them, What are you arguing with them about? Now, here, there's all kinds of conjecture. If you do any reading in New Testament scholarship in this passage, there, there are suggestions that the amazement of the people is because Jesus comes down from the mountain with his face glowing. It's just conjecture, and it has no basis in the text. I have my own ideas about where the amazement enters in, and there's a very strong term that's used here for, for their response to Jesus coming into this scene. They are shocked. They are astonished. They are blushing and red-faced at Jesus walking into this debate. I think it's as simple as when, when you're in a conversation about someone, especially when your tone is negative, and then that someone walks into the room, it has the effect of amazing you in this way as Mark communicates. They're having a discussion about the integrity of Jesus' ministry. You know, follow me here. They're doing ministry in Jesus' name, and they don't have the ability to do for this father what he so desperately needs for his son. The name, the reputation of Jesus is at stake. It hangs on the ability of his disciples to do what is required of them by this needy father and his desperate son. Jesus asked, of the disciples, what are you arguing with them about? In verse 17, the Bible says that out of the crowd, one man answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to drive it out. But they could not. It would be an easy thing for us to read through and to get to the practical application of this passage as it relates to prayer without pausing to think compassionately about this father. But here's a very real life scenario. A desperate daddy who sees his boy in great need. And he, and he, and he comes to the place, the only place perhaps in his mind, where help could be found. And so far the disciples have come short in managing this need. Can you put yourself in the sandals of this desperate daddy for just a moment? Can you imagine your own children sick, and desperate, and needy, knowing that there was nothing in your power that could be done to address that kind of need? There's no lack of sincerity on the part of this father when he comes to those disciples. And, and yet he has been objectified by the religious establishment in order to establish or, or to decide an argument between the scribes and the disciples of Jesus. This is what religion does. It objectifies people. It makes a people of real life circumstances, nickels and noses. And yet Jesus deals mercifully with a hurting father. He replied to all of them in verse 19, not with so much compassion here. We find that somewhat later. You unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. Now let's pause here and unpack some applications from our passage. First, I want you to note that the disciples have been incapable of doing for this father what needed to be done. 
The information for understanding why that is is found at the conclusion of our text when they ask of Jesus privately in the house, why couldn't we drive out this demon? And Jesus says to him, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Here is principle number one. Tuck this away in your heart, scratch it in your notes. Without prayer, you will be limited in your life and in your ministry to your own natural ability. Now, this is the trouble with the church. We have so often limited ourselves to our own natural ability. I have observed, I believe this to be true, that the decline in spiritual power in the church is directly proportionate to the increase in our resources. In other words, the more stuff we have, the better we believe ourselves to be, the more independent we become in our lives and in our ministries, thereby cutting ourselves off from the power of God available to us through the means of prayer. If you cut yourself off from the power of God by slacking with regards to prayer, you'll find yourself rising no higher in your life or in your ministry than your own natural gifts, abilities, or talents will take you. This is a scary thing. There are people who have a natural disposition toward goodness. You know some people who we call good old boys and good old girls. And apart from the power of the Spirit, they'll never rise beyond that. And then there are those of us without such a naturally good disposition. And apart from the power of the Spirit, we will never rise beyond that. I I think in ministry this happens as well for preachers. You work at at your craft, and there is something of a learned skill to, to preaching, to public proclamation. And you, and you train and, and you labor to know the Bible and to understand preaching and communicating to people. And in my estimation, as I look across the church, there are many, many men who stand and take the pulpit in their own power. And there are many, many congregations who are satisfied with the power of the preacher who would deny themselves the power of the Spirit. This is a scary thing. Apart from prayer, you will be limited to your own natural ability. You see this in your life. You know this to be true. That there's a certain degree of obedience that you have a natural inclination to achieve. There's a certain degree of ministerial faithfulness that you can achieve in your own power but to do what God would be pleased with our doing. Listen, I want a ministry that goes well beyond my natural ability. I want a life that exceeds my natural capacity for faithfulness, one that brings honor and glory and praise to God, one that says that I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit to exceed the capacity of the flesh by leaning fully on the presence of God in our life through prayer. Apart from prayer, you will always and forevermore be limited to your own natural ability. There's a second thing here. Without prayer, you become indistinguishable from the world around you. In other words, without prayer, you'll operate like an unbeliever. Jesus says, you unbelieving generation, how long must I bear with you? And he doesn't exclude anyone from that statement. Every person gathered, every person engaged in the argument, every disciple, and even an unbelieving, somewhat unbelieving father is included in this mass indictment of the crowd. You unbelieving generation, their prayerlessness is an act of unfaithfulness. The absence of power in their life is the product of their prayerlessness, which is, uh, again, the action of unfaithfulness in their life. If you, if you look at Matthew's account of what we're reading here in Mark chapter 9, 
There's a little different emphasis. There's not the practical application that Mark intends to make of this episode there, and so certain details are excluded. The main point in Matthew's presentation of this encounter between Jesus and this father and his desperate son is faith. The idea of an unbelieving father confessing that he's struggling with mustering the faith necessary and Jesus then tenderly dealing with him with his faith the size of a mustard seed. Believe, believe, believe is the message of Matthew's presentation. And there's, there's, there's really a lot of overlap between the two. Your prayerfulness is really just the acting out of your faith and confidence in God to meet the need that's been brought before you. Without prayer, again, you'll operate as an unbeliever in a variety of different ways. I, I wonder if the disciples hadn't grown overly confident in their demon-casting ability from past experiences at the sight of Jesus. If they'd not grown arrogant in their ability as Jesus watched over them in their ministries. Whatever the case was, they didn't feel, at least in this particular moment, important that they would spend time in prayer to muster the Holy Spirit power to do what they had been uh, required to do here. They were operating as unbelievers, believing they had the natural ability to do what needed to be done. There are times, if we're frank with ourselves, when our prayer life works the same way. How, how, how often does your do your prayers go this way? Lord, would you help me with this situation? And then immediately your imagination begins to run wild with logical, rational, earthly, practical, or, or, or even personal things that you can do to resolve this issue. Natural means of bringing a resolution to the issue. What we're really doing is we're saying, God, I, I hope you'll help me. And immediately our confidence is thrown out the window that God will do anything as we resort to earthly means to achieve the end that we'd hoped in the beginning God would provide for us. They're, they're more basic, rubber meets the road kind of ways that this works itself out. If you are prayerless, without prayer, you will operate as an unbeliever. So try this on. Get up tomorrow morning and spend time in prayer. And then drive through Memphis traffic. <laughs> and then Tuesday, wait until the evening to do your prayer time and devotional time and drive through Memphis traffic. And everyone who's not in jail will gather here next week and we'll talk about how that experience went. It, it, it just, you, you know this by experience. I don't have to convince you of this because your life is telling the story. You know that when you are prayerful, there is a certain power that accommodates prayerfulness that you enjoy in, in small but, but meaningful ways across your life. Now, now think again about the situation that Jesus walks into. The credibility of Jesus' name is at stake as the behavior of the disciples are being examined. Y'all with me? They're looking at the disciples to make a determination about the nature of Jesus' ministry. Can he be trusted? And rather than looking at Jesus, because he's not readily available at the moment, they're looking at his disciples. Some things never change, do they? If you're not prayerful about the smallest matters... You will conduct yourself as an unbeliever and rest assured that the world around you is evaluating the power of Jesus' name on the basis of how you live your life. They just flat are. They are watching you. They are making determinations. In fact, in looking at this passage from that perspective, I wonder if the Father did not come to the disciples with confidence that they could do for him what he needed to be done, whereas the statement of his unbelief comes only after they had failed to do what he needed. Lord, I believe. As though perhaps I believed in the past, I thought the disciples could do it, but now it's all been called into question. Now the debate has ensued about the nature of your ministry. Now unbelief is beginning to enter in. I'm looking at what your disciples are incapable of doing. I'm watching the debate. I'm listening to the argument. And my confidence in you is waning all the time. 
Brothers and sisters, the world around us is watching. And far too often they are watching prayerless and powerless believers who are haphazardly making careless decisions and communicating all the wrong messages about the nature of our Lord's ministry. Some of you need to pray before you post things on social media. Some of you need to pray before you make decisions in life. Some of you need to pray about how you behave at the ball field. Y'all with me? Youth sports is where the testimony goes to die. I'm not just talking about praying about big things. I'm talking about getting up in the morning and with the spirit of Jacob saying, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. Ready me to live this day to maximize your glory here on earth. Listen, every great move of God in the history of the church has been begun in a season of prayer and fasting pleading with God that he would grant us the desires of our heart. Don't you know he will? Jesus continues his interaction with his father, beginning in verse 23. The father has implied a question as to whether or not Jesus could do what needed to be done. And Jesus says to him, if you can, everything is possible to the one who believes. And immediately the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly coming together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. It came out shrieking and convulsing him violently. The boy became like a corpse so that many said he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him and he stood up. This is miraculous thing Jesus said come out of him and never go back and the spirit comes out convulsing and shrieking and the boy is in an instant made whole aren't you glad that we serve a living savior of great power that the demons and all of hell are no match for the power of our savior Jesus Christ Sometimes I think people get in this idea, this, this, in their mind, this idea that somehow there's a battle between good and evil. Some days God wins and good things happen. Some days the devil wins and bad things happen. No, no, no. Satan is on a short leash with a sovereign God. And only those things are permitted to happen in our life that serve the good of his people and the glory of his name. He is a great God. There is no power that matches the power of our Savior Jesus. And so he has met the need of the father, and he's raised the boy to help. The disciples ask, as we've already read, why couldn't we? And Jesus said, this kind, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. In other words, as we've said this morning, you're going to have to get beyond your natural capacity for ministry to address these kinds of needs. Now, I think there's some danger in living where we live. The danger in living where we live and being a part of a church where we live, and I am happily acclimating to the Hernando area and the greater DeSoto County area. I'm digging it. But the danger is with so much movement into our area, as a church, we can just accumulate church members from all over the Mid-South who move into our area. And at the end of every year, we can tally up our victories and feel as though we have done something fantastic when the reality is that population movement has covered for our disobedience or that population movement rather has covered for our powerlessness as a consequence of our prayerlessness. The fields are white. There is no question about it. There is low-hanging fruit to be collected in Hernando, Mississippi. But if you want to reach the least of these, if you want to do ministry where ministry seems to matter the most, where God seems to be pleased to do his greatest work, he says, I've chosen the weak things of the world to bind the strong, the foolish things to confound the wise. He seems to favor the least of these. 
If you want to do ministry on the front lines where it seems to matter the most, brothers and sisters, you must know that this kind, this kind, this kind can come out only by prayer and by fasting. Everything can be done with prayer. There's no qualification there. Now, prayer is not about bending the will of God to suit our needs. It's about a season of communication with God where he often bends our will to match his will. And then in the course of our communication is pleased to grant us the desires of our hearts as they accord with his will. Everything is possible with prayer, Jesus says. And so the disciples are encouraged to pray. There seem to be a number of misconceptions about prayer in our day and age. It, it is entirely appropriate. Y'all listen carefully. Hear what I do say, not what I don't say here. It is entirely appropriate for us to observe that there is no power in prayer. Y'all with me? There is no power in prayer. The, the power is in the God to whom we pray. Now, the reason I know that people are all crossed up on this issue is because anytime anything bad happens in our life, you get 5,000 messages that say, I'm sending you my thoughts and prayers, to which I always think, well, I don't know why. You're sending them to me. It's not that prayer is about mustering this inner energy or force. That's an idea born out of Eastern mysticism. It seems to have made its way into our culture, but that is not, ladies and gentlemen, how prayer works. It's not about combining all of our wills and our wants and our motivations and bringing that to bear in someone's life. It's about bombarding heaven with the needs of our heart and trusting that there is a God there who is able to meet our need. That's what prayer is about. Everything is possible, the Bible says, through prayer. We have a tendency to pray about things and then forget that we've prayed about them and then God answers and we quickly move on. Can you think back for just a moment about some times in your life when God was faithful to answer prayers in great ways? Most recently for us, it was coming here. Uh, you, you, it would be hard to put to words, oh, the strain uh, and the stress associated with, with that kind of decision. I don't understand the preachers who move every two or three or four years. You'll you may have to fire me and set the house on fire to ever get me to do this again. And, and yet God was faithful in opening doors and providing clarity. I, I think back to a couple of years ago when, when an 8 and 10 year old boy, 8 and 11 year old boy came home and, and with an, from church with an interest in, in praying for orphans in our family prayer times. And I, I never connected these two up, but in the years since, we've, we've been host to four foster children, still are host to two foster children, and I, I have to believe that that's the direct result of our boys being encouraged to pray for the needs of orphans years ago. I, I, I can think back on some hardships in ministry when there was friction between me and, and members of the church, and I just thought, there's no way we'll ever get beyond this. And praying through that, months later sitting down and enjoying a meal together as friends reconciled once again what seemed to be an irreparable situation God was pleased to put back together. I remember coming to First Baptist as a 25-year-old kid, scared to death. I, I preached the four best sermons I had the first four weeks, and nobody blinked. And I thought... Lord, if I'm, is this, is it, are we wrong? And I, I remember laying on the couch in the den of that parson and saying, God, I, I know you've warned us against asking for a sign, but I'm putting out the fleece. And it'd be good, Lord, if tomorrow morning you could give me some indication that this is where I'm supposed to be. We would bring the people up and present them to the church the way churches used to do. It was almost customary there. And, and we, we met at 10 o'clock, and at, and at 12.30, there were families who were waiting on people in the church to join them for dinner who were coming into the church to be a part of what God was doing. And people were in the altar and scattered from one end of the church to the other, and God put his big, great stamp of approval on our ministry there and sealed in our heart that we were where God wanted us to be. I, I can remember the months leading up to Brandy and I's, our, to our wedding, 
we, our family experiences were not positive, and I was so scared that something disastrous would happen. God had called me to ministry, and I, I, I didn't want to do anything that would jeopardize my ability to serve, and we just committed it to prayer and said, God, give us a healthy and wholesome marriage, and almost 16 years later, we're, we're still enjoying the fruit of those prayers. I can remember in October of 2004 stretching myself out on the altar at Ackerman Baptist Church and saying, God, I know that right now I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I pray that you'd open a door and provide an opportunity to preach the gospel. And within two months, God had done just that, and he blessed in our little country church. I remember responding to an invitation at Double Springs Baptist Church in the summer of 2001 and being received by the members of the church and an older gentleman, Mr. Doyle Reed, taking me by the hand and he said, your granny had our Sunday school class praying for your salvation for six months. And I've always believed that I was standing on the shoulders of those elderly gentlemen gathered and praying for me. I remember just days prior involved in a car accident whispering just three little words, God help me, God help me, and his faithfulness in doing just that, how he's turned my life around. I'm not what I want to be and probably not a whole lot from anyone's perspective, but I'm six feet and free from where I was headed. God has been so good to me. And prayer has been an integral part of that. Brothers and sisters, I'm just telling you this morning that there is a power available to us through the medium of prayer that we must avail ourselves of. Are you praying? Are you, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, you start where I started with the simple prayer of faith, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. And you know he will. He will. He'll do for you what he did for me. Church folks, I know that the first discipline that, that lags in our life is the discipline of prayer. I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm getting out of the house. I'm frustrated. It's not in the right moment. And as long as you continue to allow that mentality to creep in, as, as long as your hectic schedule is the dominating force in your life, you will continue to live apart from the power of God's Spirit at work in you. 